Hello, I'm Prof C, and I talk about generative AI, its effect on society, business, and education. And today, I'm going to walk you through a very, very basic tutorial on how to use large language models like ChatGPT. And in fact, I'm going to be using ChatGPT in this little tutorial. But along the way, we're going to explore a lot of the things that these large language models do that apply to ChatGPT, but also apply to BARD, Claude, Perplexity, and other models that are out there as well. But we have to kind of admit that ChatGPT has kind of become the Kleenex of large language models. You don't ask somebody, hey, have you asked what a large language model would say to that? You ask, hey, what would ChatGPT say to that? And so let's go ahead and let's start this adventure. If you want to, you can follow along with me. Otherwise, I put chapters down below so that you can come back and skip around as you so desire. Now, as we're just getting started, I wanted to show this diagram. This is from Taylor Mancherheim, and she is working with Section Media and teaches about generative AI. And I thought this was a very good graph to show us that there is, in fact, some learning curve associated with these systems. It seems very easy, very magical when you first start out and you're able to ask it a very generic question and you get some information back. But you start to find out if all you do is ask it generic questions, you're only going to get generic answers. So if you really want to drive your productivity, if you really want to use these models, even for creative pursuits, to think of new ideas, to mash things together in new ways, well, you're going to have to work at it. And we're going to talk about some of that work in this video and in subsequent videos as well. But just remember, there is a learning curve to it. If you really want to get a lot of usefulness out of these systems, you're going to have to learn how to put in the right prompts, upload the right examples, and find the system that's going to work best for your specific task. So before we get started here, let's talk about some basic definitions. Now, ChatGPT, as I mentioned before, is kind of our generic term for large language models. Probably not the best from a brand standpoint. They probably didn't have a lot of people check this over because, you remember, they didn't know that it was going to blow up in the way that it did. But it is a good moniker for this particular system because it tells us everything about it. First part, chat describes how we interact with these systems. It's conversational. We can use natural language, just like we were talking to a friend or a colleague, to get answers or to interact with the system. We don't have to put in a bunch of Boolean operators. We don't have to write anything in Python in order to get the answers we want out of it. We can just have this kind of conversation. And just like most conversations you might have with a colleague, the more detailed, the more specific your question to a colleague, the better answer you're going to get. And we'll talk about that more in a bit, but that's the same thing with these large language models. Generative. Okay, this is going to generate some new output. In the case of ChatGPT, it's known for outputting text. It can also output graphics now. So it uses something called Dolly 3 in the background to actually output uh, graphics as well. But it's generating something new that's very different than things such as machine learning models that might be used to categorize different images. For example, the next time you go in and see a doctor, you might find that they're going to use some sort of computer system that uses a machine learning categorization system to try to help them diagnose your illness. Pre-trained transformer. Pre-trained means that this system has been trained on a lot of information. It has been trained on books. It's been trained on papers. It's been trained on Wikipedia, Reddit, uh, Quora, all sorts of places where it's not only learned how to mimic human understanding of language, but also some practical facts as well. What does uh, this transformer mean? Well, that's kind of the secret sauce. And I mentioned the word mimic just a second ago. That's exactly what the transformer allows these systems to do, is to do statistics at a great scale and basically understand how things are related to each other in human language. And from that can mimic human understanding of language, human understanding of our world. 
they can mimic it, but they do not have a consciousness. It's obviously much more complex than this, and we will not get into that, but I will provide some references in the description below that you can check out if you want to dig into this particular aspect of what makes these systems work. But I want you to understand it really is statistics at a scale that humans have not seen before, but it is still statistics, and it is not something magical like a sentient AI. Also, this is not a search engine, so it's something to keep in mind. If you ask it what time it is, it's not going to really know, so it's very different than Google and other systems like that. So let's go ahead and get started with ChatGPT, and I'm going to start out here. There is a sign-up process. You just find that at chat.openai.com. I'll put that URL in the description below. But once you do that, you will either be signed into ChatGPT 3.5, or if you actually pay $20 a month, you'll be signed into ChatGPT 4. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this that there is some learning curve, and I would suggest that as you're learning, you might decide to go ahead and pay that $20 a month. Just maybe decide you're going to do it for two months and see if it actually is worth it or not. I found that these systems, in fact, are worth it. So you'll notice down here we have the basic chat interface. So this is down below here. You can see there's an attachment icon down here, so we could attach a file. We'll talk more about those in a little bit. But here's where we actually type in our messages. You notice also there's a disclaimer below. It says chat GPT can make mistakes. I said that this was statistics at a huge scale, but realized that it can sometimes put something together that statistically sounds great, but is not factual. We call those hallucinations. Now, I mentioned that it's been trained on a lot of information, so it's been trained on much of the world. In this case, ChatGPT knows a lot of information, a lot of generic information, up to April of 2023. So this gets updated on a fairly regular basis, and you'll see that when you make some requests in here, that it will actually go out and use Bing to search the web. That's because of their partnership with Microsoft, who owns Bing. I'll also show you some other ways to get around these limitations later in this video. But you'll notice here that if I ask it uh, to tell me about Harry Truman, it is able to do so, and it figures out that I'm talking about Harry S. Truman, though for some reason it puts a period after the S. And I'm talking about the 33rd president of the United States. It will go on to give me lots of information uh, about Harry Truman here. Now, uh, you'll notice it's building these words, these phrases, statistically. So that's why it kind of gets a little jumpy from time to time and sometimes slows down. We can also stop the output down here. So I can say that I would like to stop the output. You notice it just changed right as that... Um, uh, output from ChatGPT ended to another send, send message, but it can, in fact, have it uh, uh, stop the output if it's on the wrong, wrong track. So now, once we have the response, we can do a number of things. We can copy the response. We can tell it that it did a good job. We can tell it that it did a poor job, or we can simply ask it to give another shot at it. Okay, so maybe it's close, but we want to have it regenerate this particular response. Okay, I will do that, and then we'll see some other ways that might be a little bit better. So you see here it's giving another go at this. Maybe the words are going to be in a little bit different order. Maybe the sentences are going to be constructed differently. Maybe it will emphasize some aspect of Harry Truman's life that will be significantly different. But I want to point out to you something very practical. You notice you see two of two here. And um, it's asking me for feedback. I'm just going to close that. But you notice here, I can now start to go back and forth between these outputs. So in fact, I can branch my responses. So I can take it down different paths if I would like. So you could have multiple branches kind of coming down off this system if that's what you'd like to do. There's other things that we can do if we want to regenerate this response. For example, we might say, hey, I would like you please make this longer and more detailed. And it's going to now provide output that's more 
this longer in much more detail. I'm going to go ahead and stop that. I could also ask it rewrite in 200 words or less in an academic tone. So it understands what an academic tone is. It has read a lot of academic papers and it could rewrite this in 200, oops, I said shorts or less, but it knew what I was talking about there in 200 words or less and wrote it in an academic format. Make us, I could also ask it to make a story about Harry Truman that would be understandable to a five-year-old. Okay, so you can have it make things as a story. You can have it write in a particular author's um, uh, style. So I could say I would like a. So I could say that I would like to see uh, the story of Harry Truman told in the style of Stephen King. Now I will tell you that I have asked ChatGPT about Harry S. Truman for the last year or so in various workshops and classes, and. Early on, it actually had some wrong information, some what we call hallucinations, okay? Some bad information about uh, this particular president that it was not, in fact, true. And so just realize that you should not ask ChatGPT for anything that you don't already know or are not willing to verify. These systems are getting better and better, and you don't see that hallucination showing up here. I want to pause for just a second and talk about something that's very important with these large language models, and that's the concept of a context window. Basically, once we start this conversation with ChatGPT, we are in a certain context. We're talking about Harry Truman. If I now start to ask it about recipes or something like that, it's still going to have that previous information about Harry Truman in mind. So the thing that you want to do is whenever you start a new topic, you want to start a new chat. Okay, So that's what you want to do. But you'll see that you can go back to previous topics as well. They're stored here on the left sidebar. So think about it as a friend or colleague, and you can say, hey, I want to change the subject. Let me change the subject with your friend or colleague. So now tell me about airplanes. Okay, and it's going to do that. Okay, we're changing the context. And uh, what's nice about this is now I could ask, for example, without even referring to Harry Truman, I could say, what political party was he a member of? And within this context, within the context of the chat about Harry Truman, it's going to answer about that particular individual. Okay, because we're in that context. If I was in a different context and I'm talking about Michael Jordan, it's going to try and answer in that context. So this is a very important point. It's one that we'll get into in more detail because it also matters how long can that context window be? Can it be something where it could remember a book's worth of information? Um, it can now. Could it remember every book you've ever uploaded to it? Maybe, maybe not. So we'll talk about it a little bit more. But it is very cool that you can go between these different conversations. But always remember when you're starting a new topic, you want to start a new conversation. And this applies to all the large language models like Claude and Bard as well. Now, besides having multiple versions of this uh, original information it gave me, so you remember we kind of branched it here, I can go back and I can edit any particular prompt that I've given it and start a new branch as well. So I could say, please make a cartoon of Harry Truman. Okay, now it's making another branch here. So all that information has gone away. It's still there if I go back, but it's now going to create an image. 
Okay, and I could say create an image of him if I would like. So I can go back to that previous branch, if you will. But in this branch, I've gone back and edited my prompt. Okay, so if you get off track, you can always go back. That's a pretty good, uh, pretty good image there of Harry. So as I mentioned before, if you have generic questions, generic prompts, you can get generic results. That's fine for things like asking about a president, but if we really want to get something more specific, if we really want to get higher quality output, we have to be specific with our prompts. Now there's several different approaches to prompt engineering. You're going to see that this is a area in which a lot of people have opinions on the best way to do things. There are some ways that are better than others, but I'm going to try and give you just a little bit of uh, an approach for how you might think of this as your first starting out. Zero shot prompting is what we've been doing, where we just ask it a very generic question. So we're not giving any context. We're not talking about what is this output going to be used for. We're not really talking about the audience uh, in this original prompt. And so to get better outputs, we really want to have a better prompt. And there's a formula that I like. It's one that I've been using. And it basically says that we're going to have a role. This is going to be the role that ChatGPT is going to play. The context, in what context are we producing this output? What is it going to be used for? Then what is the task? What is the question that we are asking? And then optionally, you can add two more parts to your prompt. On the tone, do you want it to be conversational? Do you want it to be academic? Do you want it to be like an email? Or you can even upload your examples of your own writing. Do you want it to be in your own style? And then the format. Do you want it as a bulleted list? Do you want it as a step-by-step -step guide? Do you want it as a data file? Do you want it as a CSV file that you can import into Excel? Okay, so that's um, something to consider. Let's go ahead and let's try uh, this as well. Let's go back and take this example of Harry Truman and try to use this role context question tone and format. Okay, so let's give the role that we want ChatGPT to play. So we're going to tell ChatGPT who they are. You are a fifth grade history teacher in the United States. Okay, so you can have it be anything. It's really, really cool. So we get into a little bit farther down the line. I'll have another video for you where we'll look at how we can make it actually take on a role that we can interact with it. So for example, pretend you are a patient with diabetes. Here I defined the role for ChatGPT. This gets ChatGPT thinking about um, what is being written here, what is the role that they are playing when they are writing this output or they are producing this image. Okay, So they're going to be a teacher in this case. They could be anything. They could be a student. They could be a customer. They could be acting as a patient for a doctor or they could be acting as a doctor. Different roles will produce different results. Okay, what are we doing? Um, so you need to make a lesson plan about Harry S. Truman that will last uh, one hour. So this is the context. We're creating a lesson plan. We need it to last an hour. Uh, and it should have a story, hands-on activity, and um, an assessment. Please. Uh, now I'm going to go on to the question or task. Please write the lesson plan. And I'm going to give it a little more details here uh, and include lesson objectives written 
using Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom's taxonomy is something used in education to try to uh, um, describe what the outcomes are that we want for a particular lesson. Now I could add a tone, please make it conversational. It'll probably come back fairly professional. I could say that, oh, I don't know that there would be much use of providing the format, but let's go ahead and see what it generates here. So what's very interesting now is ChatGPT has, uh, in recent iterations, will now explain how it's taking this approach. So it explains itself, which is good because now the output down here will make a little more sense. Okay. So here we start to have these lesson objectives according to Bloom's taxonomy. What are some of the materials that we need? The introduction, here's what we should do. The story time, so here's a story. Yeah, I could ask it then to create a story for me. Please create a timeline template. I could go back and start asking it to do things like this. But here it gives me this lesson plan. So hopefully you're starting to see that if we have more detailed prompts, you get some better results out of this. So there's this whole area called prompt engineering, and these can get fairly detailed. One other thing I wanted to look up here, and that is that uh, if you go into the, your settings here, you have several different things, but one is custom instructions. And so custom instructions would allow you to put some of the things about the context of your writing, your role, your responsibilities, and how you want ChatGP to, to respond um, as kind of settings or default settings. Okay, so you can put all that information in here. You can see it kind of walks you through how to do that. And you can enable it for new chats, or you can turn that off. Okay, so you can put all this stuff in here, save it, and then you might uh, use that, and it would use it for all your new chats. But then, okay, wait a second. We actually want to uh, uh, not use those settings. Well, now we can go ahead and turn off those custom instructions. Okay, so I wanted to mention that as well, just so that you're aware that on the paid plans you do have that ability. There are many other abilities as well, but most of the things that I've covered here apply not just to ChatGPT, our Kleenex of the large language model world, but also to BARD, to Claude, and to other systems as well. So I hope you get started. If you got tips, techniques, or questions, please put them in the comments below.